know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer. And I'm Hans from Hans of Harkir. And we're taking a look at Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism by Richard Wolf, Haymarket Books, 2012. The key idea of this text is to explain the failures of capitalism, the failures of attempts to fix these failures of capitalism, and to propose democracy in the workplace, what Wolf calls workers' self-directed enterprises, as the cure to these problems. As Wolf states, the central thesis of this book is that moving beyond the internal organization of capitalist enterprises toward a specific democratic alternative organization of production is the way forward now. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Part 1. Capitalism in Deep Trouble The first part of this text walks us through a brief history of modern capitalism from the Great Depression and the New Deal to our current neoliberal late-stage capitalism, and demonstrates, as the section title suggests, that capitalism is in deep trouble. Wolf starts with some basic definitions, the brick-and-mortar stuff. First, he discusses the popular definitions of capitalism, which focus on private property and markets, and which often ignore that capitalism requires state intervention in both of these factors in order to function. And Wolf explains that simply looking at private property and markets does not meaningfully distinguish capitalism from other forms of economic systems, which have markets and private property. Then Wolf defines capitalism as he uses it in the text, stating, A capitalist system is, then, one in which a mass of people, productive workers, interact with nature to fashion both means of production, tools, equipment, and raw materials, and final products for human consumption. They produce a total output larger than the proportion of that output, wages, given back to them. The wage portion sustains the productive workers, it provides their consumption, and secures their continued productive labor. The difference between their total output and their wage portion is called the surplus, and it occurs to a different group of people, the employers of productive laborers, the capitalists. Hey, Mr. Moneybags, I did some math and I noticed that us workers are paid less per widget made than what you sell the widgets for. Well, some of that money goes to restock the supplies, repair tools, and to pay the security guard. Yeah, yeah, I calculated for that. But what about the surplus? The amount left over after all that? Well, that goes to me. I own the factory. I paid the initial sum to get the factory started. I took all the risks. Well, sure. I mean, really, there's no way that you individually earned enough money to buy an entire factory, so the real reason your family had enough money to make that investment was from the exploitation of previous workers, but uh, put that aside, don't we, the workers, actually take on all the risks? Breaking our backs to produce the widgets, and by tying our livelihoods, our means of subsistence, to this factory, over which we have zero say in its operations. Where's the justice in that? Mmm, get back to work or you're fired. Wolf then explains the boom and bust cycle, which I'm not going to get into here because I recently reviewed a book called The Decline of Capitalism, whose whole focus was about the boom and bust cycle of capitalism, so check that out if you want to know more about that. Wolf then divides everyone under capitalism into three categories. Productive labor, the people who make the goods and services sold, unproductive labor, those who are essential to the production of goods and services but do not produce them directly, such as custodians, receptionists, or security guards, and capitalists, those who extract and control the surplus value. Inside this system, it is entirely possible for workers to be doing well, with the surpluses of the capitalists being along razor-thin margins, which benefits workers. This was the case for workers who enjoyed strong labor unions and labor protections following the New Deal until the 1970s, although the benefits were largely only enjoyed by whites. However, the continuation of this framework eventually allowed capitalists to take back the meager gains of workers in the decades following, showing that while the system exists, the gains of workers are always in jeopardy so long as the capitalists maintain control over the system at large. Until the surplus, as Wolf describes it, is done away with entirely, workers will never enjoy the full fruits of their labor. For sure. Good point, Hans. 
Well, now with the basics, the brick and mortar stuff out of the way, Wolf then explains the history of modern capitalism, from FDR and the New Deal to Reaganomics and neoliberalism. He states, In the wake of the Great Depression of the 1930s and World War II, both the United States and Europe turned dramatically from relatively laissez-faire to relatively state interventionist forms of capitalism. Wolf continues, Social movements led by socialists and communists transformed a rather conventional centrist new democratic president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, into an active promoter of massive state interventionist capitalism. Now, when it comes to solving the problems of capitalism, FDR did not go far enough, of course. It has been said that FDR's policies, in fact, saved capitalism from revolution. FDR himself said, It was this administration... I have no idea how FDR actually sounded, and I'm not about to look it up, because that's probably just going to expose how bad I am at impressions. So just work with me here. Uh, FDR said, It was this administration which saved the system of private profit and free enterprise after it had been dragged to the brink of ruin. But sometimes that's the best you can hope for. Demand revolution, demand radical change, and then hope for the best. And Wolf acknowledges this as well. He states, the struggle within the alliance between revolutionaries and reformers ended with the defeat of the anti-capitalists. Wolf then discusses the surge of the new left in the 1960s, and the response to it, a new reactionary movement, the Richard Nixon hardhat types. Wolf argues that this new reactionary movement culminated in the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan, a key indicator of shrinking working-class support for a democratic party that had proven itself incapable of inspiring much hope because it could not even protect, let alone advance, New Deal gains. But don't go all anti-intersectionality class reductionist on me. That doesn't mean that the left lost working-class support because it adopted identity politics. No, this is about Democrats dropping the ball regarding class politics. Wolf then explains what this neoliberal late-stage capitalism has brought us. He states, The combination of computerization, exported jobs, women surging into the labor market, and a new wave of immigration ended the period of rising real wages in the United States. Thus, real wages today are roughly what they were more than 30 years ago. Well, that settles it. Modernism, women, and immigrants, they are the cause of all our problems. Let's go back to our traditional lifestyle, reject modernity, embrace tradition, get these immigrants out of here, get these damn women barefoot and pregnant back in the damn kitchen! Or, wait, just kidding, that's the stupidest idea ever. Labor-saving technology is the bedrock of our improved living conditions. Women's liberation has led to more autonomy and freedom for literally half the population. And immigration has proven to be a net benefit for the economy. So, what is the problem? Well, Wolf explains that capitalism's reliance on debt in the face of stagnant wages led to crisis. He summarizes the argument in this way. By following the money, we can grasp the economic interconnections that drove world capitalism into crisis. First, stagnant real wages and rising productivity sharply altered the distribution of income and wealth in favor of profits and increases in wealth for the rich. Second, the working class responded by borrowing vast sums to postpone the end of rising consumption that would have been necessary if they relied only on their wages. Third, employers and the rich lent back to the workers via ABS, asset-backed securities, basically consumer debt in the form of mortgages, credit card debt, car and student loan debt, and things like that, the rich lent back to the workers a portion of the extra profits they made from real wage stagnation. Now, at first glance, phrases like the working class responded by borrowing vast sums to postpone the end of rising consumption makes it sound like it was individual working people's fault for living beyond their means. But let's look at what this really means. Why were working class people borrowing money? Well, some new jobs, and in fact, many already existing jobs, began requiring employees to have certifications and college degrees, leading to an increase in student loan debt. Many folks were relying on credit cards to make ends meet, when multiple jobs on stagnant wages no longer cut it. 
and that's to say nothing about emergency expenses, like needing a new car or a medical emergency, or huge countrywide or global crises such as the housing market crash. Sure, some debt can be blamed on the individual, but the failures of this debt-fueled economy are about the failures of capitalism as a whole. Speaking of the housing market crash, Wolf wrote this book shortly after that crisis, and so when he discusses the reliance on consumer debt to keep capitalism afloat, he spends a fair amount of time detailing the housing market crash and subsequent bailouts. And Wolf concludes, Political dysfunction aggravated economic dysfunction. As this became clear, an increasing number of people began to question the system as a whole. The right, as usual, blamed poor people for taking out loans they could not afford and government economic policies for blocking or distorting what would otherwise have been a smoothly growing and profitable private enterprise market capitalism. The left, as usual, blamed greedy financial and other corporate interests and insufficient government regulation of them for the economic crises. But a significant and growing constituency rejected efforts to blame the parts in favor of questioning the whole. The system was the problem. Wolf explains that a taboo had been broken, that the system of capitalism was being questioned on a massive scale because a giant contradiction in capitalism had formed. Nationalizing the banks or other industries was considered unthinkable even as these very same industries were requiring regular bailouts and government subsidies just to survive. Essentially, as part one is named, capitalism is in deep trouble. Part two, what is to be done? This section is cleverly named after Lenin's book of the same name. And I say cleverly because this section compares and explains the problems of private capitalism and state capitalism, what is often mistakenly called communism, which existed in the Soviet Union and China and Vietnam and Cuba and elsewhere. In this section, Wolf explains that although these systems, these two types of capitalism, have some benefits, they are both ultimately failures. Wolf starts by defining what surplus means. When employers sell the output, they realize revenues. They usually use one part of those revenues to pay the employed workers who made the output. They spend another part of those revenues to replenish the tools, equipment, and raw materials used up in production. The remaining part of the revenues is the surplus, roughly the difference between the enterprise's revenues and the basic cost of producing whatever the enterprise sells. Hey, Mr. Moneybags! Shut up and get back to work! Next, Wolf explains that, in a capitalist society, how capitalists distribute the surplus determines how society functions. For example, police deal a lot with theft, petty theft, shoplifters, stolen cars and such, but not wage theft. However, wage theft by employers is much more costly to the overall economy than petty theft. But because capitalist owners benefit from wage theft and are harmed by petty theft, the police under capitalism focus on petty theft. Or for a more specific example, Y'all remember the terrorist who bombed the Boston Marathon killing three people back in 2013? He was totally confronted by the police. And by confronted, I mean that he was hiding unarmed in a boat and the police unloaded on him, and he was then hospitalized in critical condition, and several senators said that he should be tried as an enemy combatant and denied legal counsel despite being a U.S. citizen? Pretty drastic stuff. A few weeks after the Boston bombing, a fertilizer plant in Texas that was operating at like 600% beyond capacity exploded, killing 15 people and destroying 60 homes. And did that fertilizer plant get punished? Were any of the CEOs or company directors arrested? No. Wait, hmm. I, I, I just checked the Wikipedia page. They paid a fine to a family of one of the deceased in 2015 and another fine in 2018. But there were zero criminal convictions. Not one person served jail time. Despite, quote, on April 22nd, 2014, the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board released preliminary results of its investigation into the explosion. The board's chair, Dr. Rafael Moreiresso, stated, The fire and explosion at West Fertilizer was preventable. It should never have occurred. It resulted from the failure of a company to take the necessary steps to avert a preventable fire and explosion 
and from the inability of federal, state, and local regulatory agencies to identify a serious hazard and correct it. Okay, 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 I might be going off on a tangent, but I think you get the idea. White collar crime gets fines or a slap on the wrist, while working class folks get the shaft. And this is in large part due to the fact that those who decide how to distribute the surplus in society decide how society is run. And this also affects politics, both with financial contributions to candidates, lobbyists, and think tanks on one side, and with stagnant wages, working multiple jobs, and debt, leaving less time or energy for political efficacy by the working class on the other side. And Wolf concludes, We must question the very possibility of genuine democracy in a society in which capitalism is the basic economic system. For the sake of time, I won't get into a whole thing about how we don't have automatic voter registration, or that voting isn't on a holiday, or that many convicts can't vote, or that voting by mail is literally being attacked right now, or things like that. But instead, I'll just say, look at how politically active folks got when their jobs were closed or hours were cut due to the pandemic. Like, yeah, folks can be totally apathetic, but really, people do care about politics and would be much more active if they had the time and energy to do so. From here, Wolf addresses state capitalism specifically to explain why these so-called communist countries were actually capitalist. Wolf first explains surplus analysis. He states, from the standpoint of surplus analysis, what defines an economic system, for example capitalism, is not primarily how productive resources are owned, nor how resources and products are distributed. Rather, the key definitional dimension is the organization of production. More precisely, the definitional priority concerns how the production and distribution of the surplus are organized. And if we look at the so-called communist countries of the USSR, China, Vietnam, Cuba, and others, through this analysis, we see that they were not communist, but in fact, state capitalist. Capitalist, socialist, and communist countries all had bosses, authoritarian organization of labor, authoritarian distribution of surplus. In other words, capitalist. They were all capitalist. It's all capitalism. It always has been meme, dun, dun. Oh, that's not part of the script. That's... And Wolf concludes... The problem that prevented actually existing socialisms and communisms from becoming more egalitarian democratic societies was precisely their state capitalist organization of production. So what's the solution? Well, democratic workplaces, of course. And this brings us to part three, workers self-directed enterprises as a cure. This section explains that the true cure for our economic problems, the true cure for both state and private capitalism is to create worker self-directed enterprises, or what you might have heard of referred to as worker co-op, worker co-op, worker co-op, worker co-op, worker co-op, worker co-op. Now, co-ops can define a wide variety of things, some of which are barely different from your average capitalist enterprise, and some of which are basically worker self-directed enterprises. But we'll get to that distinction when the time comes. Essentially, this section is where Wolf defines worker self-directed enterprises, what they look like, how they function, and how they solve the economic problems enumerated in the text thus far. To start, Wolf states, In a worker self-directed enterprise, no separate group of persons, no individual who does not participate in the productive work of the enterprise, can be a member of the board of directors. Instead, all of the workers who produce the surplus generated inside the enterprise function collectively to appropriate and distribute it. They alone compose the board of directors. That's what the self-directed and worker self-directed enterprise is all about. Wolf then compares worker self-directed enterprises to other alternative types of workplaces. For example, worker-owned enterprises, where owners of shares have only the power to change directors at annual elections. In other words, the enterprise is worker-owned but not worker-directed, the workers are still not in control of the surplus. Worker-managed enterprises, where workers who perform managerial functions do not thereby displace capitalists or move the economy beyond capitalism, meaning that these enterprises are worker-managed but not owned or directed. Again, workers are not in control of the surplus. 
And what about co-ops? Wolf states on page 122, cooperative ownership, cooperative purchasing, cooperative selling, and cooperative labor all have been called co-ops. None of these, whatever their virtues, has any necessary connection with worker self-directed enterprises. Basically, there are many types of co-ops, some that are more similar to worker self-directed enterprises. And those like the one I work for, where workers get to vote for one of the directors and that's it. And it calls itself a co-op, but is basically totally capitalist with practically no democracy at all. What this means is that our modern conception of worker cooperatives exist on a gradient, with some taking it to mean workers simply have a stake in the company beyond wages being at a company stock portfolio or in company elections of workers to the board. Although you'll notice that worker elected members are never controlling majority of the board, so it's basically just token representation with no power. While both of these situations technically improve the lives of workers, neither realizes the dreams of Wolf and his worker self-directed enterprises. In these situations, workers just don't have a seat at the table. They are the table. This isn't to take the piss on co-ops that aren't already WSDEs, as many worker co-ops do improve the lives of the people who work there compared to standard business. They're a step in the right direction. We just need to remember our destination. Next, like the productive and non-productive laborer of capitalism, Wolf describes two types of workers in worker self-directed enterprises. Surplus producers, those who produce the goods and services, the surplus, obviously, and what Wolf calls enablers, folks like clerks, receptionists, security guards, and others, which enable productive enterprises to function. And Wolf states, the enablers and the surplus producers must together and democratically answer the following questions. One, how much surplus will be produced, appropriated, and thus be available for distribution? And two, what portion of that surplus will be distributed to secure which conditions of surplus production provided by which distinct subgroup of enablers? So, not just capitalists deciding how an enterprise is run, not just bosses or managers, but self-directed by all workers. Now what about other aspects of the economy? What about labor-saving technology? Certainly workers in a worker self-directed enterprise wouldn't automate themselves out of a job, so would technology suffer? No. Wolf's solution is that a specialized agency would need to be established that would immediately swing into action upon learning of an enterprise considering a labor-saving technical change. Wolf goes on to say that this agency will help employees, who were willing, to receive training and change jobs. In fact, Wolf posits that, actually, innovation would be quicker under worker self-directed enterprises because the benefits of innovation and automation will be shared by all workers, so there will be motivation to adopt it, rather than fear of being automated out of a job or that workers will not receive any of the gains from that innovation, such as what happens under capitalism. Y'all remember that movie Flash of Genius where that guy invented a new type of windshield wiper and then destroyed his life suing car companies who stole his idea from him? It seems like the best hope for inventors under capitalism is to maybe have a larger firm buy your idea, and then at least you'll get some initial sum from your invention. When it comes to innovation, worker self-directed enterprises is where it's at. In regards to the environment, Wolf states, Environmental concern is typically a luxury that private and state capitalists believe they cannot afford. Worker self-directed enterprises would approach environmental issues quite differently. First and foremost, workers live, play, and raise families in and around their sites of work. For them, the costs of environmental degradation are much more important and immediate considerations than for a small group of outside capitalist directors who have enough wealth to avoid living or working in places vulnerable to environmental degradation and its effects. Wolf then promotes the idea of rotating jobs so workers can build experience and competencies needed for directing an enterprise as a whole. Michael Albert, however, is against rotating jobs and instead proposes balanced job complexes, where tasks are divided more equally among the workers, which is a system I'm quite fond of. Check my review of Paracon if you'd like to know more about that. From here, Wolf explains that the ownership of worker self-directed enterprises might be nationalized or local or some combination of national, regional, state, and local, and that the relationship between these different levels needs to be democratic through and through. Wolf states, Participatory democracy at each social site depends on and fosters participatory democracy at the other. 
Worker self-directed enterprises need participatory democracy in the surrounding localities, regions, and nation for their own survival, and will therefore encourage them. Basically, workplace democracy needs workers prepared to engage in that democracy, and this requires fully functioning democracy outside the workplace as well. Wolf goes on to explain that workplace and civilian democracy is deeply interconnected. The functioning of school impacts what kinds of civilians or workers students grow into. Road construction and maintenance impacts both civilian and enterprise functioning. Infrastructure, taxes, regulation, it's all deeply interconnected. Comparing the interwoven democracy of worker self-directed enterprises and their surrounding communities to our modern capitalism, Wolf states, both private and state capitalism have had to manage the systemic risk posed by the potential for workers to use politics to limit, offset, or end their losses from undemocratic workplace organizations. Basically, democracy gives people some say and control in society, and so in response, both state and private capitalism has had to limit the leveling impulses of democracy at work and at home. The government has a defect. It's potentially democratic. Corporations have no defect. They're pure tyrannies. So therefore you want to keep corporations invisible and focus all anger on the government. Limited political knowledge and access causes citizens under private capitalism to accept bank bailouts while not nationalizing them. And citizens under state capitalism only see solutions in returning to private capitalism. Lack of democracy worsened these crises. True workplace democracy would provide workers with the knowledge, access, and understanding needed to better address these crises. Next, Wolf explains how worker self-directed enterprises will interact with capitalist enterprises. Perhaps worker self-directed enterprises will encourage workers in capitalist enterprises to demand more from their employers. Perhaps capitalist enterprises will refuse to share innovations or even work with worker self-directed enterprises, or vice versa. Wolf admits that capitalist enterprises might have an advantage in regards to things like relocating to take advantage of cheaper labor markets or lax environmental regulations. Worker self-directed enterprises and capitalist enterprises will both call on the state for help with regulation, tax power, infrastructure, and the like, though they will probably have contradictory demands. Any group that enjoys prominence in a given structure will seek to maintain this. Businesses have been cutthroat in maintaining and expanding their economic power even against one another. The easiest two examples are Standard Oil in the 19th century and Amazon right now. The former would utilize its monetary reserve to sell below market rate for months, bankrupting or forcing competitors out of the market until Standard Oil was the only one left, after which, with no realistic competition, can make the oil prices whatever it wanted. Today, Amazon does the same for online retail sales, seeking to be the sole intermediary or monopsony, meaning single buyer for sellers, dominating commerce while it works to create its own brands to replace other retailers. It's not only working to control the market, it's working to become the market. Seeing how aggressive existing businesses are towards one another, one can only imagine how they behave towards a form of enterprise whose entire existence threatens their power structure. Oh wait, we can. They will collude. They will deny resources and markets. They will seek to undercut WSDEs wherever possible. Traditional business is no stranger to horrifying tactics, particularly when backed into a corner. WSDEs are a career-ending threat to the capitalists who run today's modern megacorporations, and they will fight to uphold the system they have built by any means legal and many means illegal. Be ready for a fight. Okay. So worker self-directed enterprises will be more egalitarian, more democratic, more innovative, more environmentally concerned, and just all around better than capitalist enterprises. But that all just makes sense, so this system will probably never be adopted. There seems to be no way to meaningfully promote worker self-directed enterprises under neoliberal late-stage capitalism. This is all just a wistful utopian dream that we get to fantasize about while we go hurling towards economic crises endless wars, crushing poverty, and ecocidal collapse, watching the world burn. Or maybe not. Next, Wolf gives several examples of how we can popularize or increase the number of worker self-directed enterprises. Federal jobs programs, 
A jobs program today should include provisions to provide funding capital to workers willing to commit to building worker self-directed enterprises. Social service reform. Instead of a period of receiving regular unemployment payments, they could choose to get the total of such payments in advance as initial capital for a worker's self-directed enterprise. Other motivations include technical assistance, subsidized or guaranteed credit access, temporary tax exemptions, preferential purchasing of worker self-directed enterprise goods and services by government agencies, or how about the creation of worker self-directed enterprises as part of a Green New Deal? Programs could convert existing worker-owned, worker-managed, unionized, state-ran, or co-op enterprises into worker self-directed enterprises. Perhaps bankrupted or broken up industries could receive worker self-directed enterprise preferential treatment through tax breaks or the right of first refusal. Or hell, why not all these ideas at once? Basically, there are plenty of avenues for promotion of worker self-directed enterprises in our current economic system. And Wolf concludes, the elaboration and clarification of worker self-directed enterprises in theory are one part of a way forward now. Another part is the concrete, practical establishment and expansion of worker self-directed enterprises. Together, the theory and practice of worker self-directed enterprises compose a powerful and attractive program that belongs on serious agendas for social change today. Conclusion The foundations of the capitalist infrastructure we've known our entire lives is fraying at the seams, especially now with millions upon millions unemployed and facing eviction this year. Several of the most powerful private actors are taking advantage of the chaos to consolidate markets and drive under competition, explaining the explosion of wealth for the billionaire class during 2020. If you're curious just as to how the most powerful business barons have fought for political and economic control and achieve insight into their future strategies, I would suggest Matt Stuller's Goliath, the hundred year war between monopoly power and democracy. If you're curious as just how the more intelligent members of the capitalist world are responding to late stage capitalism, I recommend Angry Nomics by Mark Blythe and Eric Lonergan. They also see the sky is falling, but their goal is to reform capitalism to save itself from itself yet again. We now have a choice of whether we want to reform or to try something a bit more radical. Those are some great recommendations, Hans. I'm also asked what kind of books I would recommend for better economic understanding. Sometimes I recommend 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism, which is very thorough but pretty dense for a newcomer. The bread book is, of course, always a classic, although some of the stuff is pretty outdated, like the stuff about dominating nature. I often recommend Paracon as a modern critique and proposed alternative to capitalism, although I think some of the bureaucratic stuff could be updated, with incorporating modern internet and algorithm type technology to make certain processes less bureaucratic. But all that said, I think Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism, is kind of the full package. It explains the problems of capitalism, explains how the attempts to address these problems have failed, and it proposes a true solution, an alternative to capitalism. This text is fairly light on specifics or complexity, like there aren't a lot of cited sources or things like that, but that just makes it all the more readable, all the more accessible for newcomers. If you want an intro to the problems of capitalism and how to fix them, then I highly recommend Democracy at Work a Cure for Capitalism by Richard Wolff. And thanks again for helping me with this review, Hans. And if you liked Hans's contributions to this review, or if there is a book or a subject that you'd like to know more about but that I haven't covered on this channel, I highly recommend you check out the channel Hans of Hakur, where you can find short reviews of all kinds of political and historical texts. Link in the description. And as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. Your support has allowed me to get dog insurance, to support other creators I couldn't otherwise support. You are, I suppose, funding this little worker self-directed enterprise. I appreciate you folks a lot. And if you like what I do here and you'd like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash radical reviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical book reviews here with the radical reviewer. Thanks for watching.
Hey, Mr. Moneybags. Hey, I'm walking here. Why am I making him sound like that? Is it because of the hat? This is so stupid. 